Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Rod Bland coming to you from Sydney in Australia. Uh, uh, thanks for joining in for today's live stream. I think this is live stream number five. And I've got a very special guest today. It's Tony Sicoria, who I, I call a lightning strike survivor. Uh, but there's a whole lot more to Tony than that. He was recently on our channel only just last week, I think. So if you are just joining us here today, then it would be really awesome if you just let us know where you're from. Just drop a comment in the chat. I'll give you a shout out if you do that. I know there's a couple of regulars that are probably going to turn up. And uh, if you've got any questions for Tony or myself, or you've just got anything that you want to say, really, this will be the, the format uh, I'm going to. I better just edit that, actually, because that was what the uh, that's who we had on last time. I'll just put this is for Tony and uh, yeah so chuck a question in if you do have one and let's go and get our guest for today Tony hello Tony hey Brad how are you uh, very good um, so it's uh, I'm coming to you from the future again today actually it's my <laughs> Wednesday at 10 o'clock in the morning and what is it like eight o'clock at night for you on yeah, Tuesday it's, it's uh almost eight o'clock now <laughs> at night yeah uh, it's crazy yeah so uh i think if you're in daylight saving in the usa it's probably seven o'clock 7 p.m on tuesday uh yeah it's 10 o'clock where i am in sydney it's uh on the other side of the country in perth it's eight o'clock in the morning and if you were in the uk it would be really early i think it's like 2 a.m in the morning usually we have people from the uk watch their replay they don't typically join us uh live on the day yeah, I think so, six hours ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, so, so thanks for uh, joining today. Now, uh, should we do this kind of layout or... No, I think we'll do this one today. We'll just go with that. Um, so while we're waiting to see who wants to join us today, and if you are just joining us today, hello, my name's Rod. I'm joined here by uh, Dr. Tony Sicoria, who prefers Tony, and Tony is a... Uh, lightning strike survivor who also had a near-death experience and that was back in 1994 we recently interviewed Tony on our channel and he's agreed to come back to uh, have a chat with us on the live stream so if you are just tuning in drop a comment let us know where you're from I'd like to hear from you so I've got a, a couple of other questions follow-up questions for you Tony that I thought I might ask you sure. while we're seeing whether we we get anything from the uh, audience uh, one thing was I, I actually found the a video of where you were playing. Where was it? At the Mozart House in Vienna. Yeah. What a, what a yeah. incredible experience that was. Yeah. So tell us tell us about what that was like and how that sort of eventu eventuated. Because I I didn't check to see how long ago that that actually occurred. But yeah, tell us a bit more about that and. Sure. Yeah, that was um, there was a, a master class. Um, that was being offered um, by a friend of mine. <clears throat> and I had signed up to go. And as part of the as part of this master class, um, I got to perform it at Mozart's home in the basement theater, which was just an incredible treat because in being just being in the in the home or the presence of a great master like that, excuse me, it's just humbling in, in every respect. And, uh, and I got to, to give a, a small concert of just the one piece that I had uh, written, which is the music from the dream, the lightning sonata. And it was, it was an incredible experience. It really was. And while we were there, we also got to see the uh, Bosendorfer factory and how they made Bosendorfer pianos. And that was, that was an incredible treat as well. So I've never heard, I'm not a, a classical uh, music aficionado, but I've heard of Steinways and uh, Bosendorfer. Well, how do they compare? Are they sort of in the same, same ilk? Yeah. Uh, Bosendorfers and Steinways have been um, pretty much the, universal competitors um, for decades um, and they have a very different sound uh, the Bosendorfer piano is it the sound tends to billow up out 
Um, and the Steinway tends to come straight out at you. Um, so it's a little bit different sound. Um, but they are, both pianos are, are played in, in most of the big venues and, and performance theaters. So it's rare that you'll see somebody playing other than, than one of those. Um, a couple of years ago, the Bosendorfer got bought up by Yamaha and they, they made a piano that took all of the great qualities of, of Bosendorfers and, and those of Yamahas and combined it into one. I've heard that it's a fabulous piano, but I have not played it. And uh, so I've, I've just been a, uh, a Bosendorfer lover for a long time. So did you eventually, uh, and I just want to uh, shout out to Michael Marshall from New Orleans, uh, Louisiana. Thanks for joining us today, Michael. That's that's really cool. I don't think I've actually seen you uh, join us. And I appreciate the fact that you love the channel and like what we're doing. That it's means a lot. Um, so what do you have uh, in your house now? I know that you, uh, you acquired the use of a piano initially after you had your NDE from your yeah. babysitter and... What, what's the situation with your piano now? Um, when I was talking to you previously, I, in 2006, um, I was at my um, traditional piano camp for adults. And the owner's sister, who was the number one Steinway salesperson, had jumped ship and she went to Bosendorfer. And in May of 2006, she showed up at her sister's place um, with five or six Bosendorfer pianos for people to play on and uh, I fell in love with with one of them that I affectionately call number 99 that's the last two digits of its of its serial number um, and this piano actually has a pedigree it was um, the performance piano at the Salzburg Music Festival in Austria and it had been played by numerous um, very experienced and professional artists and when she went to Bosendorfer uh, part of her deal um, to get her to, to leave Steinway was um, they had to give her this piano um, which she sold, um, and I happen to be the, the happy recipient of. So that's what, that's my my daily play. It's, it's mm -hmm. like uh, people who are car fans have a daily driver, and people who are piano fans have a daily play. That's the first time I've heard that term. Yeah, it's uh, and you know I I love it, and very attached to it. So. I guess it'll it'll be here as long as I am. <laughs> so I'm interested in how um, the your well, I guess there's two things: how your NDE and also the fact that your NDE caused you to learn to play the classical piano. How that's also impacted your work uh, as um, you know in the medical profession as well as as. Um, you know, yeah. Tell us about that. Is it made? You know, that's it it's, it's been a real juggling act um, for for quite some time um, because normally my work would be 12, 14 hours a day, mm. and so I I would get up at five o'clock and I would practice until six thirty when I left to go to work, and then I would do my obligatory 12 hours or whatever it was and i would come home and i would play with the kids for a short while and when it was time to put them to bed then i went back to the piano and i and i would work at the piano until 12 one o'clock in the morning until i couldn't even see straight um, which didn't do anything healthy for my marriage and hmm. uh, or for so yourself, that, really, on that, on, living on that amount of sleep each night. 
I was I was really obsessed with with the music, and mm. I really thought for the longest time that the only reason that I was here uh, was because of the music. It was something important that I had to bring um, to the world, and it mattered more than anything else did. Um, and I and I think that I was. Some people would say I was delusional, but I was certainly possessed. And, mm. you know, there wasn't anything that I that I thought was more important than than cultivating my piano ability and to to work on the music that I was hearing um, from the dream. And then so I wound up getting divorced in 2004 i think it was um but we stayed very close um because we had three children and they really needed two parents um, and over time i had learned to find some balance in between music excuse me and work mm. And the end result of that was we actually got back together again and got remarried about eight or ten years later. Um, That's terrific. So, you know, it's, it's been an interesting uh, story in a lot of ways. The, the other thing that changed a lot was before the lightning, I was, I was headed down an academic orthopedic role. Um, and that means that I was interested in publishing articles and doing research. And I was, I was involved in, in lots of that activity. I was the chairman of a, a big spine meeting as I did a lot of spine surgery. And after the lightning, none of that seemed to matter um, anymore. It, it, it really became quite clear to me that the thing that mattered is people and and people's stories and and helping people and and I just I just let all of that other stuff go by the wayside. So my life became dedicated to helping people um, with whatever their problem was, and and the music and I I lost whatever aspirations I had of of going into academic medicine. So mm. there was a there was a big change and and you know people that that knew me um, you know even family members like my sister would you know if you asked her the you know how is he different um, one of the things that she would say is that um, he's different because he he cares more about people um, than he ever did before and about the, what people think and how they feel about things. And uh, I, I, as, I, as I've heard her talk about this, I have to think, well, yeah, I must have been some ass before this. Um, <laughs> but it certainly was a wake-up call in a lot of respects. Interesting. So... Have you seen, given that your NDA occurred quite a while ago, have you seen the public perception, public perception of near-death experiences change over the years? And do you think society is becoming more accepting and open to exploring those experiences? I think that the public is becoming more accepting, um, and even medicine is becoming more accepting. Um, in the 90s, when this happened, you didn't talk about things like this. Um, if you did, then you ran the risk of somebody calling the state and, and telling the state investigators, this guy is kind of off the deep end here. You probably should pull his license or at least investigate him. There was that kind of mentality um, that people had and in, in, in this profession. Um, thankfully, that has changed. Um, and to some extent, you know, had I had Oliver Sacks not found me, and thrown this out in the open, it would have been my little pet project, and and I wouldn't have opened up to to the ridicule that I might possibly have gotten. So, you know, it was it was a great 
event that um, that I met Oliver and that um, he took it upon himself to to put this out in a format that was palatable for a lot of people, including uh, the medical professionals. And the other thing that's happened is because people like myself become more verbal about all of these activities and things that have happened, um, it's become more accepted and, and they're starting to publish um, articles. I know that a few years ago, I had been contacted by the, the head of the Missouri Medical Journal and he had he was putting together um, a month journal. It's a monthly journal. And it's a big, you know, it's a nationally known journal. And he had collected a bunch of physicians who have had near-death experiences. And he wanted all of us to write about what our experience was. And he put it together and published it in the Missouri Medical Journal. And then he subsequently took all of that and put it into a book. So there's been a lot of a lot of work that's being done down at the ground level where people are um, being brought to the surface and and asked to talk about this stuff. And then there's some of the, the you know famous people. Um, the um, who am I thinking of? Um, like Eben uh, Alexander. Yeah, Eben is Eben is one of them. Um, and the guy that wrote uh, Life After Life. Oh, uh, Raymond uh, Moody. I'm sorry? <clears throat> I think you're talking about Raymond Moody? Yeah, Ray. Yeah, I feel terrible. I was blanking on his name. But <laughs> he was Raymond one of the first. has done a yeah. huge amount um, for, for everyone in trying to bring all of this out into the forefront. And he's a fabulous guy and extremely bright. So, you know, it, it's coming from a lot of different levels that that people are starting to become more aware of all of this. And I've been involved um, with the International Association of Near-Death Studies. And we have made a number of teaching films um, about near-death experience. And these are, these are films that are being shown to medical students and residents. Um, to bring them up to speed, to, to you know, tell them, hey, you know, you're going to have patients that want to talk about this stuff, and don't discount it. Um, there's something to it. So, you know, I think across the board, a lot of learning has has happened, and and I think that the the level of the consciousness of people has risen as a result of it. Mm. And so do you I'm think, um, sorry, there's, I'm pretty sure that at the moment, the uh, teaching about near-death experience isn't part of standard, I guess, medical training curriculum. No. I'm pretty sure it's not here in Australia either, because I, I, I know someone who's a nurse and uh, it's, it wasn't something that she uh, even wanted to talk about. Do you, do you think that that will come at a certain point of time where it'll be kind of a, like a, you know, it'll be like mm -hmm. a semester and this is about near death experiences and what you can expect. I think people, that it eventually yeah. will reach that point. Um, mm. Right now it's, it's being introduced in, in progressive programs um, where, you know, they have faculty that are willing to, to take that assignment on and start teaching about it. And as time goes on, it will spread to the more conservative centers that are a little more resistant. Um, but eventually I think that it's going to become just part of the fabric of, of that education um, because it's, it's important. I mean, people who, who have these experiences in the hospital are haunted by them and they want to know, you know, am I having a hallucination? Is it, is it real? Is it not real? What does it mean? And if you're not willing to talk about it, then you could potentially injure them for life. And unfortunately, that's, that has happened. Uh, you know, lots of physicians don't want to even entertain what it means. 
and mm. and I don't and I think part of the problem is nobody really has a clear answer of of how it all fits together and what it means. Um, there are tons of things that are written, and people have been searching, um, trying to get some understanding of, you know, where do we come from? Where are we going? What is happening? How? What is? What is our soul? And and how does it fit into the overall process of things? And that's that's a difficult task to sort through the massive amounts of literature that exist and try to come up with something that makes sense and is believable. Hmm. So, you know, uh, people you may- have, been, have been trying all kinds of different ways to get some understanding. Um, I think some of the more progressive information and useful information has come out of um, some of the studies one of them is called the RA material, R-A material. And that was, it was a group of researchers at, at Louisville in the St. Louis uh, at the university. And it was a physicist and two other people. And they originally started out where they were trying to contact alien civilizations. This is back in 1981. And, you know, there was a lot of, talk about alien civilizations at that time and so they were they were going to try to use a a single person who was a, a contact and they would she would go into a trance and and she would was able to communicate with energies from someplace else and they originally they started out trying to just pick up any information but they contacted or they were contacted by what's called a social memory complex it's a um, a group of souls that exist um, wherever souls exist and they made contact and and over a course of three years um the the person who was the um who was the contact for them um, in in trance and under hypnosis. And she would she would just spill out all of this information. And they would ask those the the people who were involved would ask questions. Hmm. And a so lot she was of like a channel. Yeah, a channel. That's the hmm. word I can think of. So they would ask, you know, the the social memory complex group of spirits or souls, whoever they were, um, would speak through the, um, this lady who was the channel and they would ask all kinds of questions. And, and a lot of the questions were around, you know, what is a soul? Where do, you know, where, do, where, do the, where do we come from? Where are we going? How, how does this all work? And, and there's been some really fabulous discussions about it. And from, from what I can put together from that source and numerous other sources, we all come from some place. Um, our, our spiritual forms come from different places. Um, we come into, we incarnate into this density, what's called third density, um, and we're here to learn. And so from from what I've gathered, when we are in spirit form, we go to some place where we work with other spirits and we figure out what things we need to learn in our next incarnation. And we make a plan to come into this reality and there could be lots of other realities, but we happen to choose this one. Um, But we come into this with a specific goal in mind. Um, We don't get to know while we're here, we don't get to know what the, what the the things that we're going to work on are, which seems really unfair to me. I mean, it's like being thrown onto a, a, a board game with no instructions 
and just a bunch of pieces and somebody just says figure it out okay yeah yeah so, i think that's what makes it worthwhile if, if you I, knew i sure hope <laughs> that uh, but the point is is that we're here to to essentially gain points you know, so the more positive points you have then you may be able to progress to the next level of evolution of your of your spirit and supposedly there's eight different evolutions that we have to go through and we're only in three and some of these things last for millions of years um but our next one um we're apparently coming toward the end of the third density moving in the fourth or fifth i'm not sure which one it is but the the whole point is you know there's only two pathways you you can go a positive pathway or a negative pathway um but if you want to if you want to mature and be able to grow into the next level you've got to be on a positive pathway and the positive pathway is essentially service to others as opposed to service to self so if you're a, a service to self individual then you will be limited in how far you can evolve for what it's worth you know it's it's hard to make sense of all of this stuff but you know that's kind of the takeaway message that i've that i have filtered out through all of that yeah i've, I've reached the similar conclusions and as you say there is a lot of information now yeah, there's a lot there's a lot of books there's a lot of uh Particularly, uh, there's more and more channels, it seems, nowadays. Um, and there's some that have been doing what they do for quite a long time. Yeah. Um, there's uh, the, uh, ones, ones that come to mind which I find uh, particularly good. I think there's a, there's a process that channels go through initially and, and they get better over time because they get better at translating the messages. My understanding is they, they receive messages via thought and then they've got to then translate that into the spoken word. Yeah. Um, um, Esther Hicks is one that comes to mind where she's, you know, look back at the early, <clears throat> early, her early sort of work and then where she's now, she's very, very fluent, it just rolls off the tongue really easily. And it's, it's just astounding how she can speak for such long periods of time without a break, without, without an um, without an R, uh, without anything, you know, uh, something that a, even a yeah. professional public speaker would not be able to achieve. And some of the, um, I mean, there's, you're right there right now. There's, there are a lot of, a lot of people who are involved in this sort of stuff. Mm. And, and I think that we're just now just seeing the tip of the iceberg, um, yeah. of, of how, how the spirit relates and, and, and how information is accessed. And, and there's been a tremendous amount of work on remote viewing. And I don't know why that's there. Um, and re remote well, the, uh, the CIA started the whole remote viewing thing back in the sort of was it the fifties and yeah forties and fifties yeah yeah I mean it's 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 incredible and then you know it it started out in in one way and then the CIA took it over and and. And Stanford Research Institute became the big um, center in California where they were doing all this experimental stuff. And, and it's crazy the, the amount of detail um, that people can gather by somehow traveling um, their spirit, you know, their spiritual process is able to, to move to different places and see different things and and i think one of the one of the ones that always amazes me is ingo swan who was was a famous one um at at sri and they had asked him down. ingo swan was it ingo i have to write that one down ingo ingo swan s-w-a-n yeah i think it's one end i can't remember it's one or two hmm. um but he was asked um, when one of the one of the big space probes that was sent out into the 
to look at all the planets as it passed by. Mm -hmm. And they said, what is it going to see when it passes Jupiter? And so he went into his meditative state, whatever he did. And when he came out, he said, it's going to document that Jupiter has rings. And everybody was like, that's absolute nonsense. There's, we don't see any rings on Jupiter. Well, guess what? When the satellite went by, it documented that there was rings around Jupiter and not just Saturn. And so that, you know, that gave a lot of credibility to the fact that, geez, there's something to this. Um, mm. And in reading um, Targ, Russell Targ was one of the big um, heads of this whole program. And, and they had a number of guys who were um, part of CIA and part of, uh, you know, these cloak and dagger uh, sorts of espionage, um, trying to look at, at what other countries were doing. And they were able to actually go into people's offices um, in the Soviet Union. They, they could actually transport themselves into this office and look at files hmm. of, of top secret in documents. Um, and, and, and then we'd come back and report it. And they, they were able to describe things that were being built. Um, and, you know, it was just amazing amazing stuff yeah, yeah one, one of my guests was uh who's uh, very is an out-of-body experiencer has been since he was an infant so he's had lots and lots of different experiences and uh he was saying how um so he can go places at will and when he was near the the white well he decided to go look at the white house or go near the white house or something i can't quite remember but he was saying there was two agents that met him in the the astral plane to say what are you doing here and go away <laughs> and and he said that they were actually uh anesthetized these two two guys and that was that was their job was to guard it from a astral perspective and i thought wow that's yeah. that's it's something like, isn't it? It, it it there's some but it's believable stuff. Yeah, it is yeah it yeah. is and you know having having been on the other side and experience the fact that it, that it does exist and and now knowing that other people can can access it um and i think that i don't know if you've ever read robert monroe's books um, yeah all of them yeah, yeah. Far journeys uh, yep. yeah journeys out of the body was yeah one of the early books that i read yeah yeah i mean you know and and you know there's a he's got a whole institute that's that's dedicated to just teaching people how to do it and mm, with a lot yeah. of these things I'd like to go there one day i'm sorry i would like to go there one day yeah it's me too I, i've taken several of the courses that they yep. offer and uh, and i think that there's a lot a lot to be learned from it but mm. it's uh, you know at this point it's still I think in its infancy, there's so much that I believe that we are capable of um, that we just don't know how to do. And having, you know, part of my my dear near death experience was that I got to meet um, Daryl Treefort, who was a he was a, a, a doctor who was a specialist in savants, and he had. Um, asked me to be one of his study group. And he had a lot of people like me that had, you know, they you know got hit in the head with something that, you know, they had surgery, they had some illness, um, all sorts of things. Um, and the one thing that we all had in common was that we all developed an ability that we didn't have before, whatever the event was. And the, the fact that if it was just one person li like me, if it was just like, uh, if I was alone in this whole group, then you'd have to say, well, there's not much to be learned from this. But you have 100 people who have a similar experience 
and out of it they come out with an ability that they didn't have before like um, some people are artists some people have enormous calculatory abilities some people can you can give them any date and they can tell you what day it was you know in, in whatever year it was and, and it's like okay how where do people find these abilities is it part of our brain or is it is it part of the memory that's the fabric of the, the universe is it in the quantum field um and you know there's a lot of speculation that that all the all of the stuff is exists around us and our brain is nothing more than a receiver it just you know for us to house the massive amount of information that we have in our little brain would would be 10 times the size that it normally is Mm. um and so you know a lot of people have tried to say okay maybe the all that information exists in the substance of the quantum field and our brain is just picking up on it it's receiving it so i think there's a lot of truth to it i know that when like from for the music you know the one piece of music i got from the dream but there have been other pieces of music that have been downloaded into my head i can if i if i sit down at the piano and i'm and I'm opening my mind, um, whatever that actually means, um, but just allows me to, to somehow receive, um, I will get music that comes to me. And, and sometimes it comes in just massive flood of music, and, I'm, and I struggle to, to write it down or, or to learn what it is. Um, and other times it, it comes as smaller pieces. Um, but it exists and it really feels like it exists in a place that ex is accessible. And I think that that's, that's the same place where other people are able to get to as well. So it's, I think there's some universal, um, ability to access these things, but nobody's ever given us a, a cookbook on how to get there. So if it can happen by accident, it can happen by purpose. And all it takes is to know how. And unfortunately, that's not going to be easy to find. Mm. You just reminded me of this. Um, this is a book from my Kindle here. This is The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. And he was saying how um, uh, like for a, a lot of writers is really getting out of their own way because he, he claims that everything he's ever written is, it didn't come from his mind. He just, he just got it downloaded to him. And uh, he said, that's really the art of, of his profession is allowing that information just to, you know, come into his brain and then he just writes it down. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, like if you, say, you, if you look at, you know, most, almost all of the great composers would, would contend that, the music was given to them from some place. You know, some people mm. they said it came from God. You know, it came from a muse. Um, but they, but they would all talk about it. I mean, Mozart was very vocal about it. He said the music would be given to me in exactly this form, and I just wrote it down. Mm. And it was just huge amounts of of material. And Beethoven said similar things. And so did Brahms. You know, they, they would all say that, you know, somebody is, they would call it a muse or they would say, you know, it comes from, um, from God, but it came from someplace other than their brain. And, you know, it, if it was just one person that said it, you, you would have some doubt, but it's not. It's many people. Um, and it's not just in that particular field. I mean, even Tesla would would say, you know, this is being given to me from this place. Um, and, you know, you have no way of verifying any of that, but 
it uh, it's just uncanny that so many people are saying the same thing. Hmm. You mentioned before uh, Raymond Mooney. Did you actually meet Raymond in yes. in person? Yeah, okay. I've, I've I've met Raymond. He's still alive, isn't he? I think. Yes, I'm he is. Sure I've seen. Yeah, I'll have to get in touch and see if you'll come on the channel. Actually. Oh, he's he's fabulous. Yeah, absolutely yeah. fabulous. Yeah, yeah. He must be. He must be like uh, getting on towards being eighty now. Because I yeah, I, I can remember reading reading that. When I, because I've been fascinated in this this kind of material since I was a teenager, I can remember reading his book in my early twenties, and I'm yeah, yeah, you know, I, I have, um, I have spoken at meetings um, where he has also been a speaker, mm, and uh, okay. and a couple of years ago, we we met up in Ontario, Canada, yeah, and uh, and he's he's a great. He's a great mind and and has a tremendous experience to draw from. Mm. Yeah, well, he's a pioneer, isn't he? And he, he brought some credibility to the whole idea that there's yeah. more to us than what our five senses can can tell absolutely. us. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. He, uh, and uh, you know, he has brought along a number of proteges, um, Bruce Grayson. Mm. Uh, who was also at the University of Virginia, um, and and they have collaborated on numerous things together. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of really big names that are part of the IANDS um, society or association, rather, um, and they. You know, they continue to put forth a lot of good information. Mm. Um, you also were saying how you've, um, other physicians who have had near-death experiences, have you made some friends who have had similar experiences to you, people that yeah. you... Uh, um, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm one of the few that has, has had music come as a result of it. Mm. Um, but, you know, almost everyone... Um, and and I've gotten to talk to um, a number of, a number of people, both that were part of the that the book that I was in from the Missouri Journal, um, but also I've served on a number of panels um, at the IANDS meeting that's held yearly, and each year they have will have a panel of of physicians who have had near death experiences and. Um, I've been on a panel with Eben and a number of the other folks uh, who've had, you know, have been giving talks about all this stuff for years. Mm. So it's, you know, it's it's really a, a great experience. Um, and it's surprising how many physicians there are who've had situations like this. I know one of the ladies that I was on a panel with, Mary Neal, um, she's a spine surgeon out in Colorado, and you know she had a you know it was an amazing story. She and her husband were kayaking in South America someplace, and she went off of falls, and she drowned. Oh. And she was underwater for about twenty minutes. Um, twenty minutes. And, yeah. Wow. And somehow they were able to revive her. Um, must have been cold and she you know she's written a couple of different books but she's given lots of talks and and one of the crazy things about her experience was um when she had her out of body experience and she um she was talked to by spirits on the other side and they told her that her son would die on his when he turned 19 and and she was really shaken by that and and it's like oh my god you know how can you give me that kind of information um and it turns out that it's exactly what happened um and she you know she was given foreknowledge um that this horrible event would would occur um and and she'd been given lots of other stuff too but that was the one thing that really, really took its toll on her. 
Um, but I've been on, um, besides, we were also on uh, a show on the Discovery Channel, which was Josh Gates. Um, oh, my God. Put on a blank. Josh Gates, I'll Google it for you. Um, Expedition on this. I'm sorry, okay. he, he, he did the program called Expedition Unknown. Um, yeah. And we, oh, were yeah, all, we, yeah. we were all on that program once um, yeah. as a group and, and talked about all this stuff, which was pretty neat. Interesting. Uh, that's, that's so it's, in you know, it's making its way into... <laughs> He, he yeah. looks like a wild, wild man. He looks like he uh, spends a lot of time outdoors. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Um, I wanted to, what else do I want to ask you about? The, oh, it, do you have any favorite books that really helped bring some clarity and understanding to your near-death experience? That you, you know, read? I think the, the first book I read after my near-death experience was I went I went online and I, I tried to find if, if somebody had had a near death experience from lightning. Mm. And sure enough, um, I did find uh, a book that was written by Daniel Brinkley. And and he was he was also talking on the phone and a bolt of lightning came through an open window and hit him and there were other people in the room they started cpr they continued cpr till he got to the hospital um and they worked on him for two hours they finally gave up and they said you know we can't get him back so they called the code and the morgue attendant is is taking him down the hall putting him in the freezer and then, and as he put him in the freezer, the motor attendant saw the sheet move <laughs> and said, oh, my God. He threw him back on the stretcher, and they ran back to the emergency room, and they started over again, and he came back. And he has, you know, he, you know, he was out for quite some time um, and had a fairly extensive out-of-body experience. And and saw a tremendous amount, and a lot of which is is chronicled in his books. Hmm. And he was also given some schematic diagrams to build a piece of equipment that would help people to separate. And and from last I I understood it was being worked on. There was a company in New Jersey that was. Um, that was still trying to perfect this um, piece of equipment. And so I don't know exactly how it was supposed to work, but um, it was uh, supposed to help you to separate from your body. Hmm. And, and I have had that experience, um, you know, clearly when, when I had my near death experience, but I've had other times where I have gone to energy practitioners and, um, and I remember one particular time it was called a reconnection where you somehow you're reconnecting your, with your spiritual form. And I remember, you know, she took me through hypnosis and I was, I'm laying there and I'm thinking, this is stupid. I'm, I'm still awake. I haven't gone out and you know, this is not going to work. And I, you know, I was really kind of disappointed and all of a sudden, I heard myself snoring. And I thought, holy crap, I'm out. <laughs> and, and shortly after that, you know, within seconds, all of a sudden, I was, I was out of my body. And I remembered I almost feeling seasick because it was like I was, I was floating. I, it wasn't like I was in a nice, steady position. And... And then, but I was amazed because, you know, I, I was ready to count it off and all of a sudden I'm out. And so it can happen. 
and you know exactly what are the conditions that are required i don't know um but it it i've had it happen multiple times um when i've gone through this sort of process and i'm hoping that someday i'll just be able to do it on my own hmm. um, without having somebody assist me so that was that was my impetus for going to the monroe institute to try to get to where I could learn how to do that um, all by myself. But then I, I haven't dedicated myself to doing that yet. So it's yeah. still, it's still a, it's on the uh, to-do list. I, uh, I found that book that's in there, Danian Brinkley, Saved by the Light. Yeah, that's Danian. Yeah. He was an interesting so. guy. He was... He was a military assassin. Right. Um, and it was his job was to, you know, he would be given a target and they were he was supposed to take them out. And when he had his out of body experience, near death experience, he he I remember him telling me about all this where he had to experience what it was like for that family. You know, so when he killed somebody, he only not only had to feel that person's pain, but mm -hmm. he had to feel the experience from all of the other people who he loved. And he was very shaken by that. Mm. So, you know, it's a it's a it's a whole and that's an interesting read. You know, it's it'd be worth taking a look at that but, you know the yeah. other things that the other books that i've i've read that i have used to, to help me try to understand one is the the raw books there's five of them um and i think they're useful um there's another set of um uh, of books that are channeled um called man being b-e-i-n-g um it's also channeled um, material and then some of the more famous um, more famous books Seth Speaks is one that comes to mind that's going back a fair way I'm sorry uh, Seth Speaks is one that comes to mind yep. which is Seth going back Speaks quite a is, way. is another good one um, and I was just Blavatsky, Madame Blavatsky. Oh um, yeah, I only just bought that one. Actually, it's it's pretty heavy going. I haven't actually uh, finished yeah, reading it. Yeah, yeah, actually, it was it was. I thought it was very good. Yeah. Um, and Phyllis Schlemmer, um, who did the the only planet of choice. So there, there's a lot of there's a lot of books, and and I think I must have over a hundred of a hundred books that are like this um that i have been reading and and some of them i've it's my third time reading because it's so difficult to to make heads and tails out of all of it um mm. that i've had to read it multiple times and have you read any uh let's just see if i can bring this one up this one here is one of my absolute favorites this book if i can get it to pop up here we go uh it's jurgen zero vistas of infinity he wrote a couple of books actually um but to get some real detail about what's on the other side uh, jurgen is explores non-local states of consciousness in much the same way uh, he hasn't been to the monroe institute but it's similar stories to bruce moen who's another one who was uh, a graduate of the Monroe Institute and yeah pretty amazing uh, stories and he takes what he sees and turns it into art and uh, digital art and other things it's yeah mm -hmm. very interesting to read if you're wanting to prime yourself I found that this book in particular is uh, a great primer if you want to have a lucid dream which is really just an out-of-body experience that you switch to while you're uh, while you're actually asleep and I found this to be anytime I've not every time, but 
when I've actually had a, a lucid dream, it's because I've been reading that book before I went to sleep. So that's that's, that's a really that's a really good one. Uh, and then Bruce Moen was the other one. So Bruce is now passed away. Uh, have you have you read any of his material? Uh, Bruce. He, he, Bruce Moen, I'll, I'll get I'll get one of his. He wrote three books similar to um, um, Monroe uh, about his experiences, and he actually attended the Monroe Institute and he so it was voyages into the afterlife. And he, he wrote three different books, uh, and it's really interesting because it, it is a backstory about Robert Monroe as well. And uh, Bruce was uh, at the institute when. Robert Monroe's wife died and then later when Robert Monroe himself passed away and Bruce would still communicate with with them and interact with uh, Robert Monroe in the afterlife who encouraged him to write these books so it's pretty <laughs> pretty amazing yeah stuff yeah uh, they're, they're quite they're quite fascinating so I have uh, one other question for you before I, I wrap sure. up one which was about if you've got any if there's any ongoing projects or research or initiatives that you're currently working on that you find particularly exciting or promising? Um, you know, I'm unfortunately I, I tend to have a lot of things going on at one time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I still work on my music um, and developing pieces that that I want to get set up to 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 write and to publish. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also writing a book. Um, oh. about my near-death experience and great and I'm trying to and it's taken me so long because I wanted to look at all of the available information that is out there and try to put it together into some semblance that makes sense um, so when you, when it's just not my it's not just my experience it's what across the board what people have experienced and and i think it will have more power than if it's just me um, yeah so i'm you know that's that's i'm about halfway through that and i'm gonna keep keep working on it and um, yeah yeah keep working on it you're it's uh a, it's a not a small task it's not yeah i i've written uh, half of a a fiction story which is based on my childhood, and uh, I I got halfway through it by doing two hours of writing every morning for about three months straight, and wow. then and then uh, life got in the way, so to speak. But yeah, it's uh, there's there's a couple of I don't know. It's if you ever run into writer's block or just I found these two books that were just enormously useful for the writing process. One was, if I can find it here, uh, it was Stephen King's uh, On Writing, I think it's called, On Writing. Uh, if I can find it here. Oh, there it is. Yep. Here, I'll, sh I'll show you this one too. So, oh, let's get the cover. Mm. Ta no, it's uh, not going to show me the cover. All right, let's just go back to the library. Anyway, th this is this is a great book. There it is there in the top left. Um, I read a number of different books about writing and that one really, really nails it, I think. And then Stephen Pressfield, which is the one in the top right, is The War of Art. That's the other one. I think it's hard not to be enthused about writing and to feel like there is a path forward if uh, after you read those two it's books. The, so. the War of the Art. Uh, yeah, it's called the War of Art. It's like the art of war, but you know the War of Art the other way around. Um, and he talks. Uh, I mean, Stephen Pressfield is a very well-known author now, and he was, um, you know, for twenty years plus, he was just a down and out. He was trying to finish books he never did. He was, I think, he was homeless at one stage, and he just thought he was worthless. You know, that he was never ever going to write what it is that he wanted to write about, and then. You know, he had a breakthrough and, and he's written about those experiences in that book. It's quite an inspirational book as well, if you ever <laughs> find yeah. yourself kind of stuck. Yeah. But, you know, if you get write the book, we'll, I'll I'll, uh, I'll shout it to the rooftops. Because there's a number of people I've had on the channel that are writing books 
uh, Jason Janis, whose comment is here, he is, uh, I don't know how far he's, he is, but I know he's, anytime I ask him about it, it's like, yeah, it's complicated, but I know he's, he's wanting to write a book about his experience as well. And I think everybody yeah. should. Yeah. It's, it's a great thing to do. And, and I, and I'm hopeful that it will help people, but getting it done is a whole other different story. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, let's, uh, let's wrap it up there. I appreciate you spending some time today, Tony, having a chat. Yeah, I'm sure that uh, anybody who replays this will find it really interesting information. And um, I'm going to, you know, reach out to some of these people that we spoke spoke about today and see if we can bring them in on the channel. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll, we'll have you back again sometime. Sounds in great. The future. Anytime. Right. Thanks. Thanks. Have a good night. You too.